Himself. People will know Dashti, but let me do the bio anyway because it's worth putting to the record. Dashti is well known for as human rights campaigner over the last 30 years. He's been involved with and led and organised many campaigns promoting and protecting both refugee rights and workers' rights, as well as political campaigns helping to improve the experience of domestic violence. Dashti helped found the International Federation of Iraqi Refugees in 1993 and is now the sec secretary, and has consistently got me into all sorts of trouble as a result of those <laughs> campaigns over the years, but it's all been worthwhile. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, on behalf of the International Federation of the Rights of Refugees, uh, I would like to warmly welcome you uh, to today's uh, meeting on the Iranian uprising. I would uh, like uh, John McDonald. Uh, Don't worry about this. This is a regular concert. <laughs> I would also like to thank uh, John McDonald for organizing and chairing all uh, this meeting. It's worth uh, mentioning that John is one of the MPs uh, who has always stood at the forefront of the table of uh, refugee rights, uh, women's rights, and the defense of uh, freedom. I'm thankful to the speakers for accepting our invitation and participating with us. What's obvious um, to us all is the radical revolutionary and the secular movement that has been marching uh, throughout Iran for more than two months, raising slogan of freedom and equality, targeting the Islamic Republic regime, saying no to it, and demanding its over. Do I need to remind you about the four decades of oppression, murder, execution, injustice, repression, human discrimination, and gender apartheid that Iranian women and the people have endured to this day. Another point to briefly refer to is the strength and the weaknesses of the movement and the dangers that the right-wing party, parties and even some of the left posed to the revolutionary movement as well as the intervention of the Western country as they have done in Syria, Libya, and many other places, the intervention changed the course of the protest of people 
and destroy the communities. Our goal in this meeting is not only to express solidarity and attract support for the demonstration and protest of women, youth, and working people of Iran who are fighting political Islam on our behalf. As a result of this panel and meeting, we want to submit a letter containing several demands signed by the participants to the British Parliament and government. The victory of the Iranian people is not a victory for themselves, but also for the freedom and the people of the region, including us from Iraq and Kurdistan. We ask the British Parliament to ask the British government to isolate the Islamic Republic of Iran at the international level, expel their diplomats, and investigate them for killing of demonstrators, militarizations of cities, and the decision of Iranian parliamentarian to, ex to execute demonstrators. I ask the speaker and participants the meet, uh, to move the meeting toward discussing the assistance that can be provided by parliament, political party, and trade union. Finally, we have a memorandum uh, with the above demand that everyone can sign and we will send it to the British Parliament and the British government, trade union, women and the human rights organization. Thank you very much. Thanks, Our next speaker is Alala, she's a Kurdish woman from Iran. For several years first. Oh, she's late. Sorry. Okay. She's another another It's flexible. Yeah. It's okay. I should get used to this, shouldn't I? Yes. Yeah. When Delala comes, I'll introduce her straight away. No? Okay, let me introduce Nazrin. Um, she became a civil rights activist when the Islamic regime took down in 79, arrested in 82, and spent eight years in prison. Her books um, include One Woman's One Woman Struggling Around, Prison Memoir, and The Secret Letters from X to A, which is produced by Victoria and Press in 2018. And as has been speaking for ages, and speaking about consistently over, over that period, despite all the stuff. Thank you. Then I was arrested in 
test for freedom. In future historians will look back on this revolution and will they judge us. This is a renaissance that will affect the whole Middle East and the price of it is human life. Your grandchildren will read books about this revolution and learn that the UK media never showed a speck of it because the UK government didn't approve of getting rid of the Islamic regime. After all, the UK government was one of four Western powers that decided to replace the Shah with Khomeini in the Guadalajara Conference in 1979. How do they like it now that people are fighting for civil rights? It seems that Western governments didn't anticipate a women's uprising and they didn't have a ready-made alternative to do a regime change. The Western governments are so scared of a secular Iran that might be governed by young people who are fed up with, the, with all the powerful governments that their only weapon now is to hide this revolution behind a thick wall of silence. A silence instead by racism. You do hear from the UK media that more than 500 people have been killed, with more than 60 children among them. No, you don't hear this from the UK media because we are just numbers, not people to them. They are saying that there is a war in the street between people and the regime, with European made bullets ringing against stones. My generation wanted the same things that this um, young generation wants now, and we were butchered. The people in the streets are fed up with gender apartheid, poverty, the lack of freedom, and they want to get rid of the regime. When I was in prison and fellow prisoners were called for execution, they would kiss us and say, stay alive before being taken away. And right now, in Iran, friends call each other simply to say they are still alive. A revolution is up, up, unfolding. The regime kills a girl, her mother takes her place. The regime kills a boy, and his father takes his place. The schools have been turned into prisons because the number of arrests is greater than 20,000, and the regime doesn't have enough space to keep and torture prisoners. It reminds me of the time when I was arrested. At that time, also, the regime was attempting to hold the revolution, and the number of arrests were so high that they didn't have enough cells. I was kept in a corridor for four months with other prisoners, with enough space between us that we couldn't talk to each other. A guard watched over us. We were blindfolded, days and nights, even when we were eaten. Then, when I was transport, transferred to the Indian prison, I was placed in a room that was made for five prisoners, but with 80 prisoners inside. The sacrifices of every Iranian who has risked their lives for the dream of freedom are not to be in vain. The rest of the world must do its part. The global media should report on the regime's atrocities and give a voice to those who are protesting and let the world see the reality of what is happening in Iran. Dear John McCain, I hope you don't mind. I have a few questions for you. And if you don't know the answer, could you please raise them in the House of Parliament? Do you know if the, if the UK government is going to be involved in regime change in Iran? Can you please ask the UK government close down the Iranian embassy and send the diplomats home. Also demand the 
we turn off the nuclear messenger of the home until this regime is no longer in power. Can you please demand from the UK government not to give visas to the regime's personnel? Can you please demand the UK banks to freeze the access of the regime's people living in the UK? Thank you.
revolution, a woman-led revolution, a revolution led by women and girls, challenging this regime, bringing it to an end, will have the opposite effect across the globe. It will be, it can be, the beginning of the end of the religious right. Uh, and, and that's why it's not just a battle for the people of Iran, but it is very important for the people of Afghanistan, of Iraq, of the region, and also, of, of course, across the globe. Uh, Britain is not immune to the rise of Islamic fundamentalism and religious fundamentalism right here as well. And so it will have a very positive effect. And I think also when we look at the establishment of an Islamic regime in Iran, which came to power in large part because at the time it was favorable for US and Western government foreign policy to have an Islamic state, to create a green belt around the Soviet Union at the time. So with this establishment of this regime, its first <coughs> steps and moves was to put the veil on women. One of its first slogans was, you either wear a veil or you will be smacked. And they imposed the veil on women and girls by throwing acid in women's faces, by putting pins in women's hair to make sure that the veil was attached. And we know in 1979, there was a mass uh, women's demonstration against compulsory veiling. And all of these movements have been suppressed, but we come to a point where now you have young women and girls from Generation Z who are not only removing the veil, but they are burning it. And this veil, it, it, it is a symbol of this regime. It came to power with this veil. And this woman's revolution is going to overthrow this regime with this very veil. Um, and so I think it's, it is really a duty of all progressive, left, working class, labor organizations, feminist organizations, socialist organizations, <coughs> to support this revolution because this is their revolution as well. And I think, you know, I personally, and I think many people in this room will have no faith in the British government. The British government has been saving our murderers for decades now, uh, at the expense of human rights, at the expense of um, women's rights, uh, labor rights, and so on and so forth. But I do have great faith in the British public, in trade union and labor union organizations, in feminist groups, women's rights groups, LGBT groups, to come forward and stand with this revolution and this universal slogan, which is the slogan of all decent people everywhere. Um, so I think that it's hugely important that we ask MPs, progressive left MPs, trade unions, uh, and others to immediately and unconditionally demand an end of relations with the British, uh, the British government's relations with the Islamic regime of Iran, that the Iranian regime is kicked out of um, its embassy, its embassy should be shut down, the Islamic Center, in Maida Vale and other Islamic centers um, in the UK should be shut down. They are dens of this regime. They are um, um, basically uh, pillars of this regime here in the UK. Um, and also, of course, for the Islamic regime of Iran to be kicked out of the Commission on the Status of Women, to be kicked out of ILO, the International Labour Organization. These are immediate and practical steps that can be taken by MPs to put enough pressure on this government to, to do what is right. Clearly, uh, this is not, I, I'm completely against regime change. It is not the job of any government to change the regime in Iran. That is the task of people in Iran. But it is the job of the government here to stop supporting uh, the Islamic regime of Iran that is massacring people. As well. <coughs> so I think that this is key, and this is the message I think we have uh, to the parliament that it is important for the British government to stop, stop uh, saving the regime. And I think we have lessons to learn from the racial apartheid regime of South Africa. Uh, you know, Mandela was considered a terrorist by the British government. And then there was so much a groundswell of support uh, by people um, in Britain and across the globe <coughs> so that the Western governments could no longer support the apartheid regime. And we want this to happen with the Iranian regime so that there can be no more support 
for a government that is a government of sex apartheid, a government of misogyny, an anti-working class government. Um, so thank you, and I hope you will uh, pass our message to the government. We'll come back after the speakers for a more thorough discussion of the actions that we need to take together to our different representative bodies. Okay, our next speaker is Sonia Mohammed, the workers' rights and political activist. Excuse me, I Worked with the women's rights organisation for that. After she left for her, Sonia's been continuously struggling for women's rights and freedom and equality for a world of world rid of divisions based on gender, race, creed, and national identity. Thank you very much. but also as a displacement person because this movement I'm quite proud of it as a dis displacement person abroad it wiped all of all the labels of uh, anyone is uh, belong to Middle East or Islamic countries that uh, ex we expect they should be Muslim and that's not that's not actually the reality, the reality is uh, the Islamic government being opposed on people by force and no one, or at least not all the people chosen for it. So that, that's why I'm proud of it. Then I can probably say I'm an atheist and I'm not a Muslim just because I was born in an Islamic uh, government. So I actually go to the point of uh, the mass uprising of the freedom seeking people of Iran. The uprising for women like freedom has been for the third month. Sorry. Right. Three months of protest and strike has faced the governmental brutal suppression and have 400 and have had 400 casualties and thousands of injured protesters. Systematic and state violence against women in Iran and the gender apartheid has been an ongoing phenomenon in Iran for <coughs> the past 40 years. Women were one of the first groups who stood against the Islamic Republic violation of people of, of people's freedom. More than 40 years of resistance and protest, 40 years of def defiance of the Islamic laws and women's total brutality against uh, women's, women's law, which is against women in that country, turned into a base uprising for freedom, women, and for equality after Mahsa Amini's murder. Today, this movement will not settle for anything <coughs> less than women's full freedom in all aspects of life, curbing the government's influence <coughs> and all its means of suppression from the moral police to the battle leaders, from the parliament to the industry forces, and curbing religion's hand from the private and social life of women. Today, the Islamic regime has desperately restored, resorted sorry, to its killing machine to convert the feminist revolution and this revolutionary mass uprising and doesn't <coughs> refrain from committing any crime. One can see little children middle-aged men and women among the victims. The killing in Iran do not consider distinction between genders or ages, an extreme from brutality of an extreme form of brutality and violence that one can accept only from a stone age messaging is in human <coughs> and child killing state. We, the freedom seeking people, invite all the women's rights organizations, organizations defining 
their rights of children, workers, and all humans, all those who seek freedom and equality to stand against the systematic violence against women, gender apartheid in Iran, and for supporting, obviously, for supporting the brave men and women who, who have risen up for fighting for freedom and equality. Under the banner of women like freedom. And we also, we also invite you to commend this official state against any violence against women in Iran. I think this situation is being, uh, that, that's the good point of it. The situation has been globally spread. And I'm so glad finally, finally, activists, politicians, mainstream, main newspapers cover the issue who, which, which people, and especially women, have been suffered for four decades. And this is a shame. A shame in this modern world. This is a massive shame that people who still are fighting for their basic rights in Iran, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in the Middle East, in other countries abroad. I can easily connect this movement, this movement of women leading it, and it goes to third months of the and continuing protest. I can easily connect it to the movement against a racial apartheid in South Africa, and Mariam also mentioned it. And all, all the politicians, all the unions and organizations abroad have come to, uh, to backing that battle. We need that today. Today is the time. Tomorrow is too late. People are killing. People, people are killing clearly in the street. And pr protesters, all day protesters, are facing the death penalty, uh, as Mariam also mentioned, that 227 MPs Islamic, Islam, in Islamic uh, parliament who voted for the execution of all protesters. This is beyond horrific. We have to act today. We have to actively act, make a statement, write an open, an open letter, and invite, invite all organizations to come along. This is an issue which if it succeeds in Iran, it can clearly affect in other countries in the Middle East and cut, cut the, the Islamic religious government at hand from all the aspects of women's life. That's what we need. As a human being, we have women's, women's right is a human right. And as a human being, we have rights to be included human rights uh, and it has nothing with nationality, it has nothing with ge uh, ge uh, geographic uh, uh, tradition. Ge sorry, excuse my English. It, it has nothing with those things, and it, it is an international demand. We have to recognize women's uh, right in Iran as an international right. And that's less than that. We have to demand for that. We, wherever uh, we are, and whoever, and where uh, uh, in our platform, as an organization, as an activist, as a politician, we have to demand for that and shut down Iranian embassy and start supporting the government and uh, their influences abroad. Uh, I have nothing to add. Well. If I had time, obviously, but thank you very much. Our next speaker is Sosan Salim, Director of Kurdish and Middle Eastern Women's Organizations and the author of Kurdish Women, the book Kurdish Women. Sosan was an active member of leading women rights organization, an independent women organization, before leaving Iran and Kurdistan in 1994. In 1999, she established the Kurdistan Refugee Women's Organization. Now in the UK, we've worked with her for years, and in 2002, she launched an international campaign against honor killing. Um, awesome. Thank you.
<laughs> it's not to be seen. <laughs> that, that's okay. Um, thank you, and um, uh, thank you for the uh, invitation for inviting me. Uh, yes, as you mentioned, we've been around for a long time and fighting for all our lives, and want to see one day there is um, a freedom uh, in, in all the countries we came in from. We are here for a reason, and that's why, but we didn't stop. We didn't stop the fighting and to be a voice for women's rights in Iran, in Iran, in Syria, in whatever country we can be. Um, after I heard the, the pain and sorrow and the powerful speech from our colleague, I'd like to bring you to Iran as an example. Because um, uh, we, the time when Iran invaded uh, America, invaded Iran, we had a hope that we get away from Saddam Hussein and we're going to have a free country. Yes, we had a freedom, but for minority, not for majority. And American first, when they stepped into Iraq, they started dividing the country into Shia, Sunni, Kurd, Arab, Turk, and also they started drinking and national reactionary party and the religion, religious party to rule the country. And what they do, instead of replying to the demand of people in the country, they started pushing women back to the house and telling them, you are male, uh, yeah, you are male, this is your family and the house. And they also started uh, uh, arresting and killing activists. And uh, what happened after it, they brought uh, the Sharia law to our law, although we were struggling against Saddam Hussein because uh, uh, their law is not circular. We were fighting against a personal status law in Iraq, and suddenly we find ourselves we are facing much worse system and uh, law affecting the life of women. Only killing started by the uh, protest that they were either prostitutes or they were bastards, and they were. Hundreds of Basi men, they were they got a power and position in the uh, Iraqi and Kurdish government, and they started. Um, they brought back all uh, Bagua culture and tradition, like polygamy, like bailo, actually, and also child marriage and uh, uh, only killing, which is now it's like everyday uh, act is happening. You know, if you go to the Kurdish news or Iraqi news, you can have every day the husband killed the wife and killed himself, the husband killed the wife, the son killed mom and killed uh, her mother and uh, his mother and killed himself. Uh, a young girl, the body found of a young girl, 17 years old. This is like every day happening and nothing, uh, nobody listening and not, nobody, uh, I mean, from the authority. Uh, this is the, the, the gift we had through the invasion of America. Instead, helping people leave in the country, because the time when it happened, I remember we were campaigning, uh, with the government and you, to not to intervene with Iraq issue, because our issue is our issue. It's not American issue, but what American created the, that environment until now, we don't have a country. Once Saddam left, we have 10 Saddam, and the system is much worse and brutal than before. And what we wanted, just we, I, I remember the time when, when Saddam Hussein collapsed. I was in Baghdad. Uh, we were asking people, what do you want? They said, if the American come to help us, okay, thank you, leave the country. But they stayed. They influenced their policy. They were there not for Iraqi people, for their policy and supremacy. And also, it opened also another door for Iran and Turkey to intervene in Iraq uh, situation, as, as, as you see. And we always we were saying, if America uh, enter any country, they, 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 uh, wash your hand from this country. They're going to destroy the whole country. And it's the same when we're talking about uh, Islamic regime. When they enter any country, the country is destroyed because they attack all human rights, all women's rights. They, uh, they bring back all uh, uh, traditional culture and uh, religion, and uh, they are not 
uh, respecting humanity and human rights or women rights. This is what happened as an example. And it's not just Iran. Look at Syria, look at Afghanistan. They were even playing with the fate of people. You know, they just looking at their uh, um, advantage. They're, they're, you know, they're looking for their policy had to influence their policy in the area like the Middle East, in the area like Africa, and in the uh, area like Asia. And that's why they destroyed the whole country from from Syria, from Lebanon to Iraq to Afghanistan, and now Iran. That's why from the point we started with until now, we don't want America. You know, one of the demands we have today, not to let uh, outside the country integrate in our demand in our right. There's a very circular, very progress movement started in Iran, and they have to decide what they want is lead by a very progressive people. It's not something they need people come from outside and give a hand to help them what to do. They know what they want. And we don't want any outside the country to intervene. That's one thing which is demanding and is very, very important. Second, any victory with this movement in Iran is a victory for the whole Middle East. You know, because the first place is Iran and Kurdistan, because they are a loyalty, they are loyal to Iran. If they were, if the movement, if the revolution success, successful, there is, is, a, is, is victory, the victory is for us. We get rid of this all hand in our country. This is all, and that's another, I'm adding again, because uh, our colleague then mentioned that to, to ask British government to close uh, Iranian embassy to stop their diplomatic relationship. This is something making that this government more weaker instead of giving a power or standing in their side. What is that? that what happened? Because we were always when it comes to Iraq, they were uh, the American pretending that came for victory to help Iraqi people. And it's a question for us. What about the time when Saddam Hussein used chemical bomb in Halabja and killed 5,000 people? Why they didn't come to rescue us? What about when they were uprising uh, in, in 1991? Why they didn't come to? They let Saddam stay in power for another 10 years, and also they put economic sanction on Iraqi people, which is the, the 500 people be, be, become victimized by the economic sanction. And that's why. We all, uh, you know, we are standing here in solidarity with Iranian and women and people movement in Iran, and we wish them all success and uh, winning what they uh, what they are fighting for. But also, in other hand, we're asking everyone to stand in our side and not let the uh, the, the outsider change the view of the people in Iran, and also hoping. John and anyone from government side to demand our demand and be in our side. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we now um, trade union speakers. Our first is John Maloney from PCS. John's the Assistant General Secretary. Um, before he was elected, throughout, he's been active trade unionist for over 30 years, took over responsibility for unions international work earlier this year and has organized across the union meetings on Iran has been undertaken and a whole exercise program within the union itself to raise the support of women and workers' rights in Iran itself and support the current revolutionary struggle. John. Uh, thanks much and thank you for the invitation. It seems to me what's happening in Iran is a vital trade union issue. I say that because many in the trade union movement won't agree. Partly because a lot of the trade union movement is parochial and can't see any further than the borders of this country. They uh, argue, why are you raising international issues? Surely the most uh, important issue is the cost of living issue. I agree the cost of living issue is a crucial issue for workers and the organized trade unions in this country. But it seems to me, if you believe in the applicability of human rights, then you have to be in the favour of human rights in Iran, just as you are in this country. Human rights, the rights of women, the rights of trade unions, 
don't stop at Calais. They don't stop at the edges of the European Union. It seems to me, and more importantly in my union, that they either have universal applicability, in other words they apply equally everywhere in the world, or else they're a complete waste of time. Therefore, if you believe in women's rights in this country, you have to believe in human rights and women's rights in Iran. And do more than that, you have to actually say, we support women and trade unionists and workers in Iran, just as much as we would support women, workers and trade unionists in this country. Unfortunately, there's another strand of thought within the uh, trade union movement and the UK trade union movement, because obviously the UK trade union movement is, uh, uh, reflects and refracts various views on the left, which will look with suspicion at what is happening in Iran. Because for those people, everything is viewed from the world of America and everybody else. So Joe Biden, the president of uh, America, says we support the Iranian women, they automatically become suspicion, suspicious. They think, well, if he supports them, we shouldn't support them. In other words, what they do is they take their political steer from a very distorted and narrow view of the world. They're the same group of people who, when the uh, Russian state invaded Ukraine, they automatically started making excuses for Russia. As I said, I think there's a clear divide, or should be, in the trade union movement. I'm in favour, and my union is in favour, of the workers and women in Iran. If you're not in favour of the workers or women in Iran, then I think you're on the wrong side. Because I think the key th battle within the trade union movement is not only going over indifference and parochialism, <coughs> i.e. thinking, what's it got to do with us? So you would have thought, given what's happened in Ukraine, the impact that's had directly on this country for the cost of living, in Afghanistan, where hundreds and hundreds of people died in this country, um, where relatives still grieve over people who were killed in Afghanistan, you think people might actually think what happens abroad, as we would call it in Britain, is vitally important. But also it's important because, as I said, there's a key argument as to whose side you're on. And I think that's the initial thing that I think we must raise in the, raise in the trade union movement. It's not only to get over the indifference, but also to posit it as whose side are you on. You're either on the, the side of young women in Iran who burn their veils or burn their headgear, or you're inside, in essence, on the side of the regime. If you're indifferent to those women, then bluntly you're indifferent to human rights across the world. You can't subdivide human rights into good countries, bad countries, people we support and people we don't support. That then raises, obviously, if you're on the right side, as I, I think my union is, and hopefully we can argue in other unions they should be, then what can we do? I think one of the key things is to raise the issue. So uh, a week or so ago, I was very lucky that Sonia Mazza actually uh, um, addressed our members um, in a, what I thought was a very successful meeting. They raised the issues, they explained the issues to our activists. Obviously, we have to follow up on that with further information, but clearly also the trade union movement with you and other groupings, we have to build up a set of demands that we put on our government, but also to find practical ways of actually uh, being in solidarity with the women and workers in Iran, but also to get the messages out for them. Because I can imagine, through the magic of digital interaction, which clearly in Iran is being very impeded, and again, it does seem strange when people say, oh, you know, maybe Iran's not so bad. If a regime is so bad, or so good, whatever way you look at it, that it has to block information to its citizens, and the only reason it's blocking that information is because it's worried what that information is, that surely should say something about the regime. But nevertheless, if unions such as myself and the wider movement can put messages out, we know through the magic of digital interaction that we'll get to Tehran and other places in Iran. In other words, people will take hope uh, uh, from the solidarity messages of the trade union movement. And that's what I will leave on, is that we have to work out what practical tasks the trade union movement must do, but we must have the fight in the trade unions to get people to be interested in this issue, and for uh, the trade union movement 
to take up that solidarity slogan that people have mentioned more than once in this meeting, which is women, life, freedom. And that's what we have to argue for, and that's what we have to fight for. <coughs> Thank you. Elena has joined us. Elena, with your permission, I'll bring in Daniel Randall from the RMC. Daniel's the Vice Chair of the RMC here in Bakerloo, Lyme Branch, and we've been campaigning on industrial and other international issues as well for a number of years. Thanks, John. Um, thanks to Dashti and the other organisers of the meeting um, for organising it and for the invitation to speak. Um, as John mentioned, my name is Daniel. I'm a London Underground worker and a rep for the RMT Union. Um, I'm here deputising for Phil Rowan, who was the president of our regional council, who was due to speak tonight, but unfortunately didn't well and sent his apologies. Um, so again, just to thank the organisers for the opportunity to speak, which I should stress I'm doing in a, a personal capacity. Um, although RMT, my union, does have um, historic policy in support of workers and democratic struggles in Iran, um, this is obviously something we need to renew in the context of the current uprising. And I hope that if there's any kind of ongoing network or committee established out of tonight's meeting, um, one thing that it could look to do is provide model motions, briefings, and other resources for trade unionists who want to take proposals for policy and practical activity into the democratic structures of our union so we can start to generalise the kind of practice that John Maloney has talked about in the PCS and the kind of activities that we're putting on there. Um, I'm not going to speak too long, I think some of what I would want to say has been covered by um, John and, and other speakers. Um, I, I, I will just say, however, that I think it's vital that we see our solidarity efforts as um, oriented to, uh, rooted in, and based on the labour movement, particularly, in a, in a very explicit way. And I, I want to talk a little bit about why I think that's so important. Um, the, the struggles taking place in Iran obviously have a resonance and a significance uh, way beyond the boundaries of um, worker struggles over economic issues. Um, but I think a lot of us in this room would, would probably agree that um, it's, it's workers organised at the point of production that have a almost unique potential power to catalyse transformative struggles over political and social as well as economic questions. Um, so as a transport worker who sees the city's tube network come to a standstill when me and my workmates go on strike, I've experienced firsthand the kind of power that workers' action has. And um, that, 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 that's a kind of basic structural reality of any capitalist society, that it's workers' labour that makes society move. And that basic reality is as true in Tehran and elsewhere in Iran as it is here in London. And despite decades of fierce repression, including the arrest, imprisonment, torture and murder of workers' leaders, um, Iran's workers have maintained um, heroic and inspiring traditions of independent organisation um, in Haftapa, in the, the bus company in Tehran, in the oil sector and elsewhere. And there's a lot of people in the room tonight who many of us have campaigned alongside for many years in solidarity with independent workers' organisations in Iran. And conscious action by those workers and their organisations in alliance with uh, women's struggle with student struggle is, I would argue, an irreplaceable foundation in any movement that aspires to a truly revolutionary horizon. You know, the, the, the word revolution has been used a number of times tonight, I think rightly, and I think if that's the terrain we're talking about, and if that's the horizon we have, I think we have to think about you know, who, who is the revolutionary agent in society. Um, and you know, I adhere to the perhaps old-fashioned idea that it's the working class. Um, I think as labour movement activists here in Britain, for those of us that, that are, I think we have a responsibility to amplify and support those struggles um, as directly and practically as we can. And there are some very obvious, immediate, easy ways we can do that, which might feel symbolic or even token in the context of the kind of uprising we're, we're talking about, where you know thousands of Iranians are risking their lives. But I think those symbolic token actions are a sort of necessary first step. So I was on the protest on the Saturday the 19th, a couple of weekends ago, a number of you were there as well. Um, there wasn't any visible presence from the British Labour movement on that demonstration, no trade union banners, no Labour Party banners. And that's something very immediate that we can do inside our movement. We can mobilise our movement, whether that's in union branches, constituency Labour parties, whatever it might be, 
to come out onto the streets with the Iranian community in London and take part in those protests, both to just be there in solidarity, but also as a form of political intervention, because you know those protests are quite heterogeneous and diverse politically. There's all sorts of elements on those protests, when they run the gamut from left to right. And I think a visible, distinct intervention and presence from the organisations of the labour movement and the left can, can help intervene in that political debate about what kind of revolution is it that we want to see in Iran and, 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 and what, what's the alternative that um, we're supporting to the Islamic regime. So next time one of those demonstrations take place, um, I, you know, I hope, hope we'll, we'll be able to mobilise together and see a, a visible presence from the British labour movement on that march. Um, I did just want to add, just as a sort of contribution to the discussion and in, in, in a spirit of um, comradely debate perhaps, that um, for me I think a focus on sort of lobbying the British state to kind of cut ties with the Iranian state or, or shut down facilities linked to the regime, which has, has been su suggested by some of the speakers in the discussion, for me that, that is perhaps a slightly misplaced immediate focus. I think the British state's diplomacy is not the mechanism for effecting radical change or social transformation in Iran. And I think that our efforts as grassroots activists here in Britain are perhaps better focused at thinking about what we can do to provide support, whether that's political support, or, but, but also direct material solidarity with the struggles in Iran that we see as, as being the mechanism to, to, to sort of change society. And the radical potential of those struggles which I see as a, as a potential to revolutionise Iranian society on, on, an, on an egalitarian basis, is something that the British government is going to see as a threat rather than something to support. Um, so it's up to us to provide that material solidarity. Um, the, the best traditions of, of working class internationalism are those that see workers in different parts of the world taking direct action, leveraging our own power over the production process to support the struggles of workers elsewhere in the world. Whether that's Lancashire cotton workers in the 1860s in this country taking action in opposition to slavery, whether it's dockers right around the world who have traditions of refusing to load munitions bound for imperialist wars or authoritarian regimes, whether it's Scottish factory workers refusing to repair jet engines for Pinochet's regime in Chile, I think these are the struggles and the traditions that we should look to draw on and develop now. Now, I don't know immediately what that kind of action would look like in the context of solidarity with struggles in Iran, but one potential role for a committee or network that might emerge out of a meeting like this is to consider that question. What power do British workers have directly in terms of our role in global supply chains and in global production processes that we might be able to leverage in support of the struggles of workers in Iran? Um, we did see in the early period of the Russian invasion of Ukraine some action by British dockers and energy workers um, is essentially taking unofficial illegal strike action you know, because uh, industrial action over political issues is prohibited by anti-union laws in this country. We, we, we did see some action of workers you know, attempting to kind of disrupt, use their power in the workplace to kind of disrupt the Russian war machine. And I think we should think about whether British workers in terms of the companies we work for, their global supply chains, have any power to um, uh, do something similar, um, both to, to, to support the struggles of workers in Iran, crucially, and also to um, use that kind of class power to um, un undermine the regime. And that's the kind of note I want to sort of finish on, really, and reiterate this idea of a, a solidarity that is class-based, that is, that is rooted in the labour movement, and I'm not saying that out of any sense of kind of solipsism because I, I'm a worker and a trade unionist myself, but it's really about this analysis of, around where power lies in society. Um, uh, comrades have talked about this revolution being a women's revolution. I absolutely echo, uh, entirely echo the sentiment behind that. And I don't mean by arguing for a focus on organised labour and on workers' action to detract from or, or um, pull focus away from the um, very central role of um, struggle over gender oppression. Um, but again, I think it's a sort of structural reality of any capitalist society that is workers, it's, you know, it's production, it's the workplace that's the sort of engine of that society and it's actually there that has the power to change it. So what I th think we should discuss is, you know, both what can we do to support those linkages in Iran, 
you know, where workers are taking action and what can we do to support linkages between workers' struggle, women's struggle and students' struggle. And then here in this country, um, for those of us that are active and, and, and um, based in the labour movement, what can we do to mobilise workers to support solidarity protests, but also, as I say, to potentially leverage our own class power in support of what's going on in Iran. And just a sentence to finish, look, our world is very uncertain, it's chaotic in many ways, it's a sort of bleak and frightening time, but there are always sparks of hope. And I think the uprising in Iran uh, and, and also just in the past few days, renewed working class and democratic action against um, the regime in China as well are two flashpoints, I think, of popular resistance to authoritarianism um, that should inspire us and impel us to, to, to act in response in, in the best traditions of, of working class internationalism and solidarity. So I hope that's something we can develop out of the discussion today. Thank you. Ruth Cashman from Unison was going to join us, but she's ill with COVID at the moment, so we will go through for tea. Well, they have joined us now, um, and I'd like to invite her to speak before we open up for discussion and questions, okay? Let me just read her little bio. You, you might recognize this. <laughs> it's a Kurdish, she's a Kurdish woman born in Iran, fought for several years against, first against the Shah, then against the Islamic Republic, and then during the 1939 revolution. And she was then fled to Iraq, where she lived for more than a decade, then displaced again to Turkey during the first Iraq war. Eventually, she was given asylum in Sweden, where she had to rebuild her life, qualified as a social worker, gained a degree, and worked to improve the lives of women and children. In 2005, she uh, moved to England, where she founded the Middle East Women's Group, and also worked ever since to help displaced women rebuild their lives. I just came uh, from another conference that I uh, uh, had a big conference uh, uh, in England, which I like, and it was uh, really rewarding in solidarity with women, uh, liberation movement in Iran. And a part of my speech is the learning and my experience from this conference that brave uh, activists from Palestine, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and myself from Iran, Palestine. Um, we gathered and we talked uh, about how we learned from uh, the uh, uprising and women's uh, uh, struggle from Iran and uh, what would be the sense for the rest of the world, for everywhere in the world. First, before I go to that, I really want to, I'm always passionate to tell about my uh, life story. Um, as a rebel and young teenager in Kurdistan of Iran, uh, I lost nine people in my family. And uh, my partner was just 21 and I was just 18. And then after that, two Muslim brothers, we never find the grave of uh, my partner. Even I, I traveled three big prisoners with her, his mother, but we couldn't find him. So I am in future one of the witnesses that I wanted to testify in the court, public court, in future Iran, that I wanted to uh, stand up as a witness against the Islamic <coughs> Republic and all their um, hatred to you know, whoever they are. And I really wanted, I wanted to tell you here, I really wanted to change them, the way that they changed all the prisoners, all the women, in uh, during all these 40, 43 years. And for me, there is no mercy at all for them. Uh, also, I'm against the uh, execution, of course, as a political opinion, but I really feel that in future Iran, we really need to have an open public court against all the Islamic Republic. Uh, speaking about the past, so five countries and two countries travel until being a refugee, being a migrant, then at last uh, rebuild our lives. So of course, rebuilding life in this country is not so easy because it was so many glass ceilings in front of you, and so many times you had your head by the uh, shock of the how they treated migrants and refugee people. 
but I think I was one of the resilient healers that I survived, survived perfectly. That's why I am here to uh, help other women uh, to heal. Uh, one of the lessons that we talk about today in the conference was about if Iranian women could do that in 43 years, they never gave up. And from the first very day, they say no to Islamic Republic against the world. And all the time during all these 43 years, they fought it. So it means that everywhere else, women can do that. And one of the other lessons is that if uh, we are looking for alliance, the best alliance is men, because women in Iran, and where men and women in Iran show. Maybe it's one in a million that's happening. So much men are side by side women during this century that we are looking uh, where else is happening such an amazing uprising. Men and women are so united. Because for years, in the four decades, by um, uh, theoricians, by uh, multiculturalism, by feminism side, uh, always we've been told that women just must rely on our own power. And we are the only people that we bother about our rights and we must fight for our rights, which is not true. It's, it looks that we need alliance. And the best alliance could be men side by side because that's, uh, that's the ideology of capitalism, capitalism that always divided men and women and then uh, or communities or nations uh, segregating between them, and then they gain it from that. But unity between men and women, women, and unity between the uh, other movement, like the working class, students, universities, uh, teachers, nurses, all of them are united in Iran. It seems that uh, women's movement, whenever they wanted to look after the alliance, is not a state, it's not any um, hierarchy of the um, status. It's just all the people in uh, the country that they, they are. It's this alliance of them. Another thing is that always we have been told that we must look after our communities, our societies, whether they will accept us, accept this right or not. Or our community or our society are not ready for that. Women in Iran show that actually we don't need to wait another hundred years that our community, <coughs> our people respect us and accept us. No, I want women's rights right now, whether you digest it, this right for me or not, whether you accept it or not. And that was the excuse for years, for years, not just in the other Middle East countries, strongly. Uh, in Middle East country was hierarchy of the religion and state or everything. But even in the Europe, look at our community in our Europe. All the time they refer us to the leaders of the community, to the religious leaders, to say that, oh, our community is not, is not ready. What does it mean it's not us, uh, they are not ready? I don't need it, anybody will be ready here. I want my right right now. And I am standing here. And then uh, another thing that I think, um, because I'm talking about women's uh, side, women's issues. Another thing is that actually in 2008, the mass demonstration started in International Women's Day. And women came with all their um, kitchen stuff and then uh, making noise. And then, do you know, it was huge in Brazil. Everywhere, Italy, Spain, it started from Spain. Actually, women had it enough these promises from the states, from everywhere that they are promising for a better life. They came because they were hungry, they were uh, unemployed, they hadn't got it, uh, enough money for their own family. It was against economic injustice. They came and shouted out. It shows that if oppression is not a fighting against oppression is not enough. Of course, we have been oppressed by religion, by state, by systematic state, or everything. But at the moment, 
economic injustice is one of our big enemy for women and girls. So therefore, for that, working class is best alliance in this situation for women movement because we have one uh, common uh, dream about the better life, and this is the equality. At the moment, women like freedom is very popular. This is brilliant. It's really good. Everybody has this one. But this could be added equality as well. Because when pressure, maybe some of the states as well, accept some, uh, decrease the, some oppression from the women. But how about the uh, equality? Uh, male dominated society is very structured in our community, in our country, even everywhere. So these male structures, male dominated structures, must be fight in every stage, including one of them is that women must be educated, women must get a job, opportunity for good job, women, women must be independent with their own economy, and when they are independent and can manage their life, so therefore their voices will be stronger. Therefore, freedom for freedom and equality is the two strongest, which is really, really important, not just for Iranian women's movement, but also for the rest of the world. And also, I think uh, women's right is too much global rights, and right now it shows everywhere. I think for future, uh, the lesson from Iran would be that very soon, at least, at least it started from the beginning, very soon that so many women are standing up and uprising against their own state, both for oppression against the religious states that they have and for economic inequality, against economic inequality. Thank you very much. Wherever possible, uh, mobilizing our movement, the labor trade union movement, and others 